white sleeve record. It is it's difficult to keep this in a strict chronological sense. So as we move through this, keep in mind that much like you tell stories and I tell stories, we don't always, like when you tell a story about a trip that you've been on, sometimes you mention the last thing you did first because it was the most interesting. Sometimes you'll mention uh, a person you met or a place you saw, and as you tell the story about your trip, you go through things that interest you or that are part of the way that you tell the story. Whether it was Moses who wrote Exodus or not, or whoever the author is, they're telling the story the same way that we tell stories. This was largely communicated orally before it was written down. And when we talk about things, we talk differently than we write. When we write, it's a much more formal feel. These stories were, were told first by, by folks much like we tell stories. The part that we often forget, and I can't emphasize, emphasize this enough, in oral cultures where not everybody is literate, telling a story the way you heard it is very important. And your ability to remember is much stronger. It's more focused. It's more humble. I'll give you a really good example. When I was working as a, well, I worked in a small store in Wilmore. Wilmore is a little town of about 90 homes. We had one stop sign when I was growing up. Yeah, I know most towns brag about a stop light. We bragged about our stop sign. <laughs> There's a little, a little store, and when I was somewhere between 14 and 15, I started sweeping the, the lot, doing odds and ends, mowing the grass, and then finally they took me inside and taught me to run the cash register. Now, the cash register there was kind of interesting because sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. So, one of the things that we often did was to take a piece of paper and write down the prices of the things that were in the order, and then you would add them just like you would add anything else. And believe it or not, I actually became very good at adding long columns of numbers very quickly. Now, if you would go back and get my 15, 16 year old self, and me today and have us add the same columns of numbers, I can tell you one thing. I don't add numbers in columns nearly as quickly as I used to. But I haven't practiced. When I was doing it a hundred times four days a week, as opposed to one time every four or five months, you lose those skills. When your mind is attuned to listening and remembering, instead of depending on writing it down, you remember differently, with more accuracy because you do it all the time. Storytellers in the ancient world were highly trained. They would tell the story, and the people who knew the story would check them to make sure they were getting it right. If they didn't get it right, and they had to correct and go back. So there was a great deal of work that went into making sure the story was told correctly. Now, as you get into the, the literate time, scribes had long methods for making sure that the text they copied from page to page was identical. In fact, one of my favorites, would they use the center line. And all the letters in the center line would have to match on the copy to the original. And if they didn't match, you started over again. Now, I don't know if you've ever painstakingly done calligraphy, copying one document to the next. It's a lot of work. And it takes time. And mistakes. Today, we have wonderful things like whiteout. In those days, you would take a very sharp knife and you would gently scrape that layer and remove the first layer of ink. And then you would correct your mistake. It was a lot of work. 
So I, I don't doubt that these stories that were passed down, whether it was orally or written, that the form we get is very close to where it started. Because people took care to make sure they got it right. Whether it was transmitted orally or in a written form, there's a great deal of care involved. Now the story is told in a non-linear fashion at points. Other points, the, the chronology runs a bigger picture, but in some places we move back and forth in time, and this is one of those movements back. All that said, let's look at the text. In the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and some of the elders of the people and set before them the words of the Lord, the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. All the people responded together, We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud, so that the people will hear me speaking with you, and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people said. And the Lord said to Moses, Go tell the people to consecrate themselves today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. He shall surely be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand shall be laid on him. Whether man or animal, he shall not be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, may they go up on the mountain. After Moses had come, gone down the mountain to, to the people, he consecrated them, and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, Prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning, with a thick cloud over the mountain, and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in camp trembled. When Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke, because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people, so they will not force their way through to see the Lord, and many of them will perish. Even priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out <coughs> against them. Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us. Put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, Go down and bring up and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way to come to the Lord, or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Pray with me, please. Gracious God, as we look at this text this morning, open our hearts and our minds to hear from you. Let us understand what it is you are communicating to us this day. Help us to hear what we need from you, whether it is comforting 
or afflicting. Help us to grow and mature. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the beginning of the giving of the law. And we, we see all kinds of interesting things taking place in the text here. Um, if you, you come back to the first few verses, we're given a very specific time. In the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day they came to the desert of Sinai, after they set out from Rephidim, they came, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. I wish I could tell you exactly where this is. I wish I could show you a picture up here in the wall and say, this is the mountain of God. So tomorrow morning you can jump on an airplane and go there yourself and see the place where God spoke to Moses. Wish I could do that. <clears throat> But I can't. What we have identified as Mount Sinai, well, if you go there, you'll find a very nice monastery up on the top that you can go up and you can, you can see. It's been there since about the third century. Uh, so it's ancient. And if no other reason, you, you want to visit there to see an ancient monastery, it's pretty cool from what I hear. Uh, there's an ancient library there. Um, Monks have been living there for almost 2,000 years. I don't know about you, but I think that's rather impressive. <laughs> Is it the place where Moses talked to God? Well, maybe. But then again, maybe not. Part of the problem is you'll notice that they camped near Mount Sinai. And we've got somewhere in excess of a million people. And you'd think if a million people camped somewhere for a while, there would be some archaeological evidence of it. Wouldn't you? But you know what you don't find at Sinai? Any evidence of a long-term camp of a large group of people. I mean, even if you scale that back down to 100,000 people. Shots, even if you scale back down to 10,000 people. You put 10,000 people in one place for several months, you're going to leave some sort of evidence of habitation. But there's nothing there. At least nothing's been found. Now, does that mean it's not the place? No. But there's no physical evidence to suggest that it is. There are other options, and we can talk about that. The point is, we don't actually know where this took place, and we can't pin it down on the map. And why is there a mountain in the Sinai Peninsula known as Mount Sinai? Well, at the time, the mother of the Roman Emperor Constantine identified several places as being biblical sites. One of those was Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula. So if you want to know why there's a monastery there, it's because Helen, Constantine's mother, identified the site Constantine paid to put a monastery there. Is there a tradition for this being the site that goes back beyond that? Well, there probably was because some local person took Helen there and said this is where it happened. But is it the only place that's known as the mountain of God? No. There are other candidates in uh, the Middle East that work very well for the mountain of God as well and also have a history of being the mountain. So, if you're planning a trip to see the mountain of God at Sinai, I'm sorry if I ruined it. But if you do go, enjoy the monastery. It's still 2,000 years old and pretty cool in and of itself. Um, so, Israel's camp there in the desert in front of the mountain of God. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you were to say to the house of Jacob. And what you to tell the people of Israel? You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words I speak to the Israelites. 
The message that Moses is given to take back to Israel is rather incredible. Now, God is saying, even though everything on the earth is mine, everything in creation belongs to me, all the people groups, everything that's there, they belong to me. If you keep my covenant, you will be my treasured possession, and you will have a specific role to fill. You will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, if I ask you a question, what does holy mean? What's the first thing that comes to mind? So, no, ruined my quiz game. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you gonna come up and help me? <laughs> okay. So we're gonna look this way and talk to people, all right? Holy means set apart. So, I don't know about you, but um, my mom had good china. Still does. And when we were kids, we never saw the stuff. Except on specific occasions when some important person came for dinner. Now, important, you can define any way you want to, but you know, it was those rare occasions that the good china would come out and be put on the table. There's a story that went with it. When my dad was in Vietnam, um, he, he sent her a letter and said, I found a nice set of china here at the PX, I'm bringing it home. And she'll tell a story that she was terrified about what she was actually going to find. She thought it was going to be some very gaudy thing that, that just was not what you would want to put on the table. Instead it was white and just simply had a, 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 gold, it's a gold or silver trim on the outside edge. Very simple and plain, but very nice. She was pleased incredibly. And because of that, we never saw the stuff. It was holy, it was set apart. Being holy does not imply that it shouldn't be seen, it shouldn't be heard, or that it is otherworldly. It simply means that it is set apart for a special use. For a while, when Kevin was living, since I'm telling family stories. <clears throat> he had a little John Deere tractor. And it was kind of funny because for a while, when he wasn't playing with it, he would put it up. And it would sit there like on a shrine. He, he treated it differently than the rest of his toys and set it apart. I suppose you could say it was holy. I don't know how John Deere would feel about that. But we all have things that we set apart, don't we? Anybody have a favorite book that always stays on the shelf and is treated reverently? It's holy. Pictures, family heirlooms, mementos, things that we set apart that we keep because they're treasured. They have a unique role. Now sometimes they're very functional like my mom's china. Now we didn't see it often, but it did come out from time to time. But it had a use, it was, it was intended to be used. God said to Israel, that you'll be set apart, a holy nation, with a unique function to be a kingdom of priests. Now, what's a priest? The most basic definition I'm going to give you today is this. A priest is one who functions as an intercessor between people and God. In fact, in the text that we look at today, Moses functions not as a king, not as a tribal leader, but as a priest. He functions as the intermediary, the intercessor, the one who goes between God and the people. It's the elders who decide that they would agree to God's terms, but it's Moses who brokers the deal. 
He's the one who intercedes for the people. Now, if Israel is to be a kingdom of priests, it would imply that they're not to be priests for each other, but for the whole world. That notion of being a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, is also picked up in the New Testament for the church. In fact, we in the Church of the Brethren have talked about the priesthood of all believers. Part of the reason that I'm down here and not up in the box is because we all have this role of being priests. We are to intercede for those who are not part of the church. Our role is not to be here for ourselves, but to be here for the world. We are a kingdom of priests, just as Israel was before us. Picking up in verse 7. Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them the words of the Lord, the Lord of the Lord commanded him to speak to them. The people all responded together, We will do whatever the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. The Lord said, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud, so the people will hear me speaking with you, and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So Moses functions here as the priest. Here's the example. And to be honest, Moses functions here as a type of Christ, one who intercedes between the people and God. Now, I would much rather have Jesus as my intercessor than Moses, because Jesus is the second part of the Trinity, fully God and fully human, understands our, our situation, our, our temptations, our troubles, our... He understands life. And pleads for us in the presence of God. Moses does that here as well, but he doesn't understand what it means to be God also. And Moses comes down to the elders and said, this is what God said. And they said, we agree. We want to do this. We understand. And so God said, consecrate them today and tomorrow. And have them wash their clothes. Now, does that sound like an odd thing? Yeah, you're in the desert, wash your clothes. I don't know if there was a, a laundromat around the corner or not. Um, I'm not exactly sure how they took care of all those details. But can you imagine the amount of water must have been involved? The logistics of something like this are huge. Now, most people didn't have a lot of clothes, so they, they didn't need to wash what they were wearing. But two days to get ready, to consecrate themselves. Well, what does that mean? Well, they're being set apart as holy. They're being set apart as God's priests, as this kingdom that will function for others and not for itself. And one of the last steps in being set apart is to be clean. So they wash their clothes. Now, they're yet ready for the third day. The third day? I mean, come on. If we miss the symbolism here, it's just kind of sad. Jesus was set apart. He was killed. And on the third day, he rose. 
On the third day, the covenant is being finalized. This is not accidental stuff. This is one of the core stories that the people of Israel share. It is part of the five books of Moses. And depending on which group of, of Israelites you would have talked to throughout history, there was no question as whether or not the first five books, the Pentateuch, were holy. The time of Jesus, the Pharisees said not just the books, but also the writings and the prophets. What we understand is the Old Testament today. The Sadducees would have said it's just the five books. There wasn't a Jewish group that didn't agree that the five books were holy, were sacred, were scripture. And this is central stuff. This is key to understanding who the people of God are. When you start talking about the third day in the New Testament, among people who had been thoroughly versed in the scriptures, do you think they would have missed this? Not at all. Not at all. Now, did Moses expect Jesus to rise on the third day? Probably not. But in looking back, there is no way we can pass over this, this intentional inclusion of the third day. Now, verse 12 tells us, put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not go to the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. He shall surely be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on him. Whether man or animal, he shall not be permitted to live. Only when the ram's, ram's horn sounds a long blast, may they go up in the mountain. So the mountain is not set aside permanently as a no-go zone. This is a place where during the, the consecration of the people and the meeting of God and Moses that no, you can't go up there. It is set aside. It is unique. It is a place that is just for this meeting. Now again, there's a certain amount of symbolism here that I can't just walk by. When the tabernacle is built, there is a section where only the high priests can go. The Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies is to be the place where God's presence resides. This mountain right now is functioning as the Holy of Holies. Later in the temple, there will be the Holy of Holies. But you have to remember, one of the things that happens at Jesus' death and resurrection is the rending of the, the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the next part of the temple, indicating not that God was gone, but rather that access to God is broad. Not just one person once a year. Now, with Christ Jesus, we have access to the Father. Powerful symbolism set up here in this ancient story. So there's a mountain, right? Where does the mountain start and stop? Well, it's easy to tell what the top is, isn't it? The highest point. Where do you find the bottom of the mountain? At some point, they agree this is the bottom of the mountain. And you're not supposed to step over that line, whatever that limit was. Because if you do, you got to die. Well, what happened to anybody stepped into the Holy of Holies? They were killed. In fact, the folklore is, it's not biblical, but the folklore is that you tied a rope around the waist of the priest who was going in just in case that God struck him down. So you can pull them out and you didn't have to worry about dying if you went in. Now notice, what, what happens? How are these people who, not just people, but also animals who step onto the foot of the mountain, what's happened to them? They're either stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand to be laid on them. Why is that? Well, if they're on the other side of the line and you cross the line, guess what happens to you? You have to be stoned or shot. 
So you go in there and you kill the person who's not supposed to be there and you're in there, then what happens to, well, you see, it just gets to be an ugly cycle. So don't cross the line. Let's be honest, though. When someone tells us not to do something, what's the first thing we want to do? Anybody ever touch a thing that's been freshly painted because there's a sign there that says wet paint just to see? Anybody ever do that? Yep. I picked up one of those wet paint signs when I was in college and put it on my door. Cut down the people knocking. <laughs> Lots of fingerprints, though. I don't know what that was about. Mm -hmm. This is temporary, though. This, this holy place is set aside just for time. After a long blast of the ram's horn, then you can go up. But for this meeting, this time, this particular place, it's set aside as holy. Now, why not make it permanently holy? Because then you have a shrine that people travel to. And we're not in the promised land yet. And how could the residents of God be outside of the promised land if that's where God's people were going? You see the inherent conflict that that sets up? Now, the mountain of God, some say, is actually in Jerusalem, where the Temple Mount is situated. But we know we're not that far yet, so these two can't be the same place. But people go back to the mountain of God, or to Horeb, as it's otherwise known, and it becomes a pilgrimage point for some, but not for all. Well, at any rate, let's move on to the text a little bit here. After Moses had gone down the mountain with the people, he consecrated them, and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, Prepare yourselves for the third day, abstain from sexual relations. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning, the thick cloud over the mountain, and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood in front of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended on top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord. And many of them perish. Even priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. So this begins with Moses coming down from the mountain of God, consecrating the people, following the directions, washing their clothes and making the necessary arrangements for the third day. When the third day came, the mountain was covered in thick clouds. And there was thunder and lightning. Good thunderstorm is something to watch, isn't it? When I lived in Ohio, I'd sit in my front door and I would watch thunderstorms rolling across the flat ground. It's incredible to see. You see the lightning strikes far off in the distance. The temperature would drop, and the rain would come, the wind would blow. They were incredible. I don't know what this particular occasion was like, but the clouds, the thunder, the lightning, the trumpet blast was enough that everybody in the camp was terrified. They trembled. Have you ever been in such a violent storm that you trembled, that you were scared for your life? That's what we're not talking about. In the midst of this, Moses gathers the people and leads them out of camp to the foot of the mountain. 
And there at the foot of the mountain, God descends. And the mountain is covered with billows of smoke, like smoke coming out of a furnace. So there's thunders and little thunder and lightning. There's smoke. The mountain is starting to tremble itself. Have you seen footage of a volcano erupting? That's what comes to my mind as I think of this. And can you imagine being at the foot of that mountain watching this happening and not running for your life? Standing firm, waiting to meet with God in the midst of this storm and this volcanic eruption or whatever it was, and waiting. And then in the midst of this, Moses calls out to God and God answers from the top of the mountain and says, come up. Walk into this. And Moses does it. I don't know about you, but Moses gets courage points here for me. Walking into this, this is an exercise in faith in and of itself. And this is what God does. God calls us from places that are safe, and comfortable into what looks dangerous and devastating that we might be matured and transformed. <clears throat> One of my favorite quotes is from Soren Kierkegaard who said that the job of the church is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. On this day, Moses was leaving the comfort of camp and walking into a dangerous place. But not by himself, leaving the whole company of people to the foot of the mountain. And there, there they met with God. Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us. Put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, Go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up and see the Lord, or he will break out against them. So Moses went down and told the people. God has said repeatedly, that the people can't come up the mountain. Not even priests at this point. Just Moses and Aaron. He said if, if they force their way through, if they cross that, that line, the Lord will break out against them. Interesting phrase, isn't it? If you cross the line, God's going to kill you. Many will die if they try and come and see the Lord. It seems like a strange thing that's developing here. But what we see is that God is wholly different than us. And that simply being in the presence of a holy God is dangerous for us. We can't do this on our own. We need someone to intercede for us. That day the intercessor was Moses. For us, the intercessor is Jesus. In the book of Hebrews, we are told that we can come boldly to the throne of God. It, not, not cowardly, not, not in obsequious step. No, I'm not going to get that word out right anyway. But we can come boldly because our intercessor is Jesus. And there our, our concerns, our problems will be met with grace and mercy. 
We have this incredible high priest, not in Moses, but in Jesus. Who is always pleading our case. Not simply so we can have a nice life, but so that you and I can be priests in God's kingdom. To intercede for others. We're not blessed simply to enjoy it so we can sit back and be comfortable. We are blessed so that we can be agents of change and transformation in the lives of people around us. In other words, as priests, we don't just take care of each other. We are to intercede for the rest of the world. And some of those people may eventually become priests in the kingdom of God. And they may not. That's not our job. Our job is to intercede for them and be as Christ for them. Now I know that sounds kind of strange. And I know there's a lot of days we don't understand how that works or even what it means. And unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into it today. But what I will say is this. Take the risk to intercede for others. Take the risk to be a blessing for others. And I have this deep-seated conviction that you will find your way. It doesn't take much to be kind, to be genuine, to love others. In fact, Jesus said we are to love our neighbors. We're also to love our enemies. And that's really what we're talking about at the end of the day, isn't it? What does it mean to intercede for others? It means to love them as we have been loved. So, look around you, not right now, but as you go through your week, and find the most unlovable people you can find and love them. After all, that's what God did for us, isn't it? Lord, I know it's easy for us to say that we should love other people, but what does that mean? Well, Lord, help us to realize that if we see someone hungry, to love them means to make sure they have food. If we see them without clothing, to, to give them what they need. If we see them without a place to stay, to, to make sure that there is shelter for them. And Lord, <coughs> these simple things often become complicated, often become difficult to manage because there are so many problems around us. But Lord, we trust that as we step out in faith and comfort the afflicted, that you will provide the means and the way for us to love the unlovable care for those who have no one to care for them. To be a type of Christ in their lives. That they might have hope and peace of life ultimately in you. Help us, Lord, to take up this task of being a kingdom of priests. Not for each other, but for the world. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, what would you like to pray about today? We did a call here tonight. We're going to go for a chat with the citizens. We're hoping to know them.